Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the Planeswalker hating cookie, Sir Ginger the Meal Ender. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, please consider supporting the channel directly through either Buy Me A Coffee or through our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commanders we'll be covering next, and which commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Sir Ginger the Meal Ender is a 3-1 artifact creature food knight that costs 2 and has the following 3 abilities. Firstly, so long as an opponent controls a planeswalker, Sir Ginger gains trample, hexproof, and haste. Secondly, whenever another artifact we control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, we put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Sir Ginger and scry 1. And lastly, we may pay 2, tap her and sack her to gain life equal to her power. Breaking down her core stats, Sir Ginger is sporting a low to the ground CMC, a high power low toughness stat block for her cost, and a set of abilities that enable her to grow more and more powerful over time as our artifacts hit our bin and our opponents cast walkers, while also giving us the option to use her to stabilize our life totals if we need to. Taking a closer look at her second ability first, since it's arguably the most powerful of the three, it simply allows Sir Ginger to become a bigger and bigger threat over time, while simultaneously providing us with repeatable card selection as our artifacts are sent to the bin. Now, at surface level, this seems to be a consolation prize of sorts as our opponents destroy our artifacts, but as we delve deeper, we'll see that there's much more to it than that. Firstly, since this ability procs when any artifact hits our bin, this also applies to our artifact tokens, specifically those that we can sack away ourselves for value such as treasure and clue tokens, enabling us to be much more proactive in empowering Sir Ginger without having to solely rely on our opponents to do so. And that's on top of tacking on a free scry 1 to whatever other benefits sacking said token would provide. Then secondly, since artifacts have absolutely no shortage of entrants that can sack themselves away in order to activate their effects, we can take advantage of them to empower Sir Ginger, and then use the robust artifact recursion suite Colorless has at its disposal to be able to do so over and over again. Now, with her quote-unquote main ability covered, we're left with her other two abilities, which are admittedly a bit more niche but are nonetheless effective. With her first ability turning her into an untargetable, hasty, and trampling threat if there are any planeswalkers present when she comes down, which may not happen often, but is exceptionally good when it does happen to allow her to make use of her increased bulk by hitting harder and faster, as well as protecting her and the counter she accrues from targeted removal to ensure she can stick around for longer while her third ability provides us with a way to convert the stats she accumulates into life gain if we have no other way to keep her alive, or if we just need to stabilize our life totals in case of an emergency, which is always nice to have in our back pocket just in case. So, as we can see based on her abilities, Sir Ginger is a commander that cares about artifacts hitting our bin so she can load herself up with counters, turning herself into an ever-growing commander damage dealing threat, while simultaneously improving our consistency as she does so via her repeated scries. So, in order to empower and generate as much value off of her as possible, we'll be taking this build in an artifact self-sacking direction, aiming to load up Sir Ginger with as many counters as possible so she can inflict massive amounts of commander damage while we dig through our deck for more ways to enable her. As such, we'll of course be running plenty of ways to generate artifact tokens that we can sack away for value, a variety of other artifacts that either have self-sacrificing effects, or are sack outlets themselves to keep procking Sir Ginger while they provide us with even more value, a decent selection of artifact and colorless support pieces to empower and derive value from our colorless artifact playstyle, and capping off with even more ways to protect, empower, and enable our commander to get in for damage to ensure she'll be the one taking chunks out of our opponents. 
So let us travel once again to Eldraine, where Sir Ginger, the mother of Cookies, the sole survivor of the Boiling Cauldron, and the last of her batch, travels the ravaged lands atop her noble steed, Cinnamon. And while she's barely four inches tall, one should not underestimate her strength nor her raw hatred for planeswalkers. She, after all, has been one of the few non-planeswalkers to ever face Garrick in combat and live to tell about it, and is fueled by a burning vengeance for him eating her love right before her eyes. And while he managed to escape her that day, she will not rest until she finds him again and drives her lance slash fork into his eyes to avenge her soulmate. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's take a look at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off with the creatures we'll be running in this build, we'll first be focusing our efforts on including a wide variety of repeatable sack outlets to both help empower Sir Ginger and to generate us value as they do so. As such, we'll be running Kaldrotha Forge Master, which can repeatedly sack away three of our cheaper artifacts and or artifact tokens to cheat any artifact from our deck into play at no mana cost, which is even better than usual in this build by tacking on plus three plus three worth of stats onto our commander and letting us scry three every time we activate it. Scrapyard Recombiner, which serves as another free and repeatable sack outlet that lets us turn our excess artifacts into tutors for our constructs, of which we have a decent number of, including the previous entry, and Extruder, which is yet another free sack outlet that this time lets us turn our spare artifacts into additional plus one plus one counters for any of our creatures, essentially allowing Sir Ginger to grow at double the rate to really pile on the commander damage. Then, as our last two sack outlets on bodies, we'll also be adding in threefold Thunder Hulk to our arsenal, which admittedly does cost quite a bit mana wise, but does come down with four artifact bodies for the price of one initially, and later, can consume the artifacts it creates and others to make itself bigger to create even more artifact bodies with every swing, ensuring we always have spare artifacts in play to sack away to empower our commander with, as well as Metalwork Colossus, whose massive CMC 11 cost is made much more palatable by our variety of non-creature artifacts helping reduce its cost, generally allowing us to drop this gigantic 10-10 beatstick onto the battlefield at a substantial discount or sometimes even for free, and, even if our opponents are able to get rid of it, we can easily return it back to our hand by sacking away two artifacts to resummon it later, while, again, procking our commander in the process at no mana cost. And as one last sacrifice-themed artifact creature entry, we'll also be running Burnished Heart, who can sack itself to get two basic lands from our deck into play, which, thanks to Wastes having been recently reprinted in the Eldrazi Unbound precon, we can now run to speed up our mana base with without having to break the bank in the process. Now, since we'll be running a whole lot of ways to get our artifacts into the bin, it only makes sense that we also run ways to get them back just in case we need them again later. So we'll be running Mirror Retriever, Junk Diver, and Workshop Assistant, all of which return an artifact from our bin to our hand when they die off, making them all superb sack fodder that can replace themselves and we can get additional uses out of when recurred through other means, in addition to Scrap Trawler who instead turns every single one of our artifacts into artifact recursion as they're sent to the bin, generating us additional value as our opponents pick off our artifacts or we sack them away ourselves, so we can continue to enable and empower our commander with them. Then, with all our artifact sacking and artifact recurring creatures covered, we'll move on to a trio of creatures we'll be running exclusively to empower Sir Ginger so she can inflict as much commander damage as possible. Those being Steel Overseer, which provides us with a manaless way to get even more plus one plus one counters on Sir Ginger so she can grow even faster, as well as empowering the rest of our board so they can crack in alongside her or screen attacks for us instead if needed, Suspicious Bookcase, which serves as a decent blocker early, and later becomes a rogue's passage on a body that we can use to guarantee our commander can get in for damage even on the most clogged board states by bypassing blockers altogether, 
and a scavenged brawler, which initially serves as a decent body on its own with an impressive number of keywords for it to take advantage of, but its real draw being its ability to give its stat block and keywords to our commander from the bin to make her an even bigger, evasive, non-tapping, life-gaining threat. And lastly, to close out our creature base, we'll be adding in a few more on theme entrance to help pad our core stats, with Palladium Mirror earning a spot by being a soul ring on a body to speed up our colorless mana base with, so we can cast more spells and pay for more activated abilities, Solemn Simulacrum making it in as another way for us to speed up our mana base with via fetching up wastes as it comes down, and then later cantripping when it dies off, making it superb sack fodder and an excellent recursion target to keep generating us value. And finally, Academy Mana Factor also makes it in as a way for us to take advantage of the decent number of treasure and clue generation sources we'll be running, more on those later, so we can generate three tokens for the price of one when we create them to generate us even more value while empowering our commander even further as we crack those tokens. That covers all our creatures, and since we won't be running any instants, let's move straight into our sorceries. Due to our low number of non-creature and non-artifact options available to us in Colorless, we'll only be running a singular sorcery entry in this build, that being all is dust, which is one of the few board wipe options we have, but thankfully is near perfect for this build, dodging all of our colorless permanents while forcing the rest of the table to sacrifice all of their colored ones, almost always setting our opponents back to square one while leaving Sir Ginger free to crack in for damage on now boards free of blockers. That covers our singular sorcery, and since we won't be running any enchantments either, let's move on to our artifacts. So, considering that our commander's all about our artifacts going into the bin to empower herself and to provide us with repeatable card selection, it should come as no surprise that we'll be running a wide variety of artifacts that we can sack away to help enable our game plan. Starting off with some removal options we'll be using to disrupt our opponent's game plans while enabling ours, we'll be running Goblin Firebomb, Universal Solvent, and Unstable Obelisk as sources of permanent destruction, which, while they are all very mana-intensive to activate, the first two are cheap enough to play early and then sack away to our other sack outlets to proc their effects instead while empowering our commander, while the third can be used as a mana rock to help speed up our mana base until we need to use it as removal, Spring Jaw Trap and Spike Pit Trap as damage dealing artifacts that are a bit cheaper to activate than the previous trio to help us deal with mid-sized threats at flash speed, with the second one even having a better than 50% chance to net us a treasure as well to get an extra proc off of Sir Ginger, and lastly, three bowls of porridge as one final source of targeted damage that, if we need to, we can also use to tap down a creature or sack it away to pad our life totals for extra utility. Then moving away from removal and onto artifacts that can replace themselves as we sack them away, we'll be adding in Mishra's Bobble, which, despite being delayed, costs us no mana to proc our commander while replacing itself, Conjurer's Bobble, which serves as a dirt cheap artifact that this time draws us a card immediately when it sacks itself away at no mana cost to proc our commander, Candy Trail, which costs a bit more to sack but makes up for it with its ETB Scry 2 and gaining us life when we sack it, Mind Stone, Hedron Archive, and Dreamstone Hedron, all of which are already decent colorless mana rocks to help speed up our mana base with, that, when we don't need them anymore, give us the option to sack them away to draw us cards and proc our commander. Spare Supplies, which draws us a card when it comes down and when we sack it away. And a Dungeoneer's Pack, which is admittedly slow, but when we do get to sack it, not only draws us a card, but also generates a treasure to proc our commander with, life to pad our life totals, and grants us the initiative on top of that to generate additional value through the Undercity. Soul Guide Lantern and Stone Speaker Crystal will then also be joining our arsenal as Graveyard Hate to help us combat against graveyard-focused builds. 
with the former giving us some initial graveyard hate when it comes down, and then gives us the option to blow out all our opponent's graveyards if we need to, or to use it as a cantrip instead if we need the draw, while the latter serves as a decent colorless mana rock initially, that we can later sack to cantrip and exile all our opponent's graveyards instead. We'll then also be running Treasure Chest in this category, which can sometimes be unreliable, seeing as it does have a 5% chance to deal 3 damage to us for its 4 mana activation cost, but otherwise is all upside. With its treasure generation speeding up our mana base while proccing our commander 5 additional times, its draw and life gain being generally useful to help replenish our hands and life totals, and it's nat 20 turning it into an artifact tutor that can bring up our most powerful artifacts directly into play, which may not happen often, but can be backbreaking for our opponents when it does. Limbus and Wedding Invitation will then also be slotted in, both of which can trip on ETB instead of when we sack them to give them some more immediate value, but still give us the option to sack them away for additional benefits gaining us life while spinning itself back into the deck to be drawn again in the former's case, or making our commander unblockable to alpha strike in with her massive stat block in the latter's. And lastly, to wrap up our card advantage generating self-sacrificing artifact entries, we'll be adding in Hilda's Crown of Winter to the build, which initially serves as a way for us to repeatedly tap down the biggest threat at the table, which, later, we can sack to either partially or completely reload our hands depending on how aggressive our opponents are cracking into each other or us to help replenish our resources. And then to close out the remainder of our self-sacking artifact entries, we'll be running Wayfarer's Bobble as a simple but effective source of land base ramp that we can use to fetch up our wastes while proccing Sir Ginger, Welding Jar as an effective way to protect our commander from destruction that we have multiple ways to recur to be used again, Expedition Map as a cheap way for us to get access to any of the many utility lands we'll be running to enable our commander or to generate us additional value, and Moon Silver Key which at base we can use to fetch up a waste to ensure we can cheaply make our land drops, but, much more commonly, we'll be using to fetch up artifacts with mana abilities to help ramp us or provide us with additional utility. Artifacts like Soul Ring and Thran Dynamo, which of course will be running as excellent sources of mana acceleration that are even better for us than usual since we're colorless all the way down, ever flowing chalice, which is a very serviceable scalable mana rock that's both useful in the early and late game depending on how much mana we want to pump into it, and can even be used as free sack fodder if we need to, and, surprisingly, Forsaken Monument, whose ability to increase the amount of colorless mana our colorless sources generate not only counts as a mana ability to make it hittable off of Moon Silver Key, but is also an absolutely fantastic addition here since it essentially doubles all the mana our lands produce, while also empowering most of our mana rocks mana generation as well, gains us life off of every single spell we cast to help add our life totals, and pumps our commander and all our other creatures on top of that to enable them to crack in even harder. Now, staying on the topic of ramp, but pivoting slightly to artifact token generation that we can use to proc Sir Ginger alongside our other self-sacking artifacts, we'll be adding in some treasure generation to the build in the form of Prying Blade and Gold Vein Pick, both of which work nicely alongside Sir Ginger to suit her up and deal additional damage while ramping us every time she's able to connect to our opponent's faces, Noble's Purse, which generates us three treasures across three turns to both speed up our mana base and empower our commander, which we can then sack away to our artifact sack outlets once it's used up to generate even more value, Collector's Vault, which is a decent source of repeatable card selection and treasure generation to help enable our commander while turning our dead cards into potential playables for two mana a pop, and a treasure map, which admittedly does take at least three turns to generate us treasure, but, in the meantime, provides us with repeatable cheap scry to help smooth out our draws, and, once it does transform into treasure cove, lets us convert the treasure it and our other sources generate into card advantage if we don't need the mana. 
Then, to close out our self-sacking artifact token generators, we'll be running the legendary artifact Tamio's Journal, which provides us a free clue token per turn that we can use to generate card advantage and or use as sack fodder for our other sack outlets, or, if we're able to stockpile the clues it creates, lets us turn them into a mana -less tutor instead to greatly improve the build's consistency, all while further proccing and empowering our commander either way. So, with all our self-sacking artifact token sources covered, we'll be adding in another trio of artifact sack outlets to help us turn those tokens into value without having to rely on their effects to do so. Those being Throne of Geth, which can turn our artifacts into a free proliferate per turn to empower our commander and all our other counter-laden permanents, Trading Post, which instead lets us turn our artifacts into card advantage to help replenish our resources, though we can also use it to turn our artifact creatures into artifact recursion, which can be very useful to recur some of our more powerful self-sacrificing artifacts, or artifacts that our opponents were able to destroy, and Piston Sledge, which is another free sack outlet that we can repeatedly use over the course of a single turn, so long as we have two creatures to keep re-equipping it, enabling us to turn all our spare artifacts into Sir Ginger triggers as soon as it comes down, while it itself provides her with a sizable stat boost to empower her even further. Now, staying on the commander empowering game plan for a moment, we'll be adding in a few ways to directly empower our commander outside of her own effect, starting with some ways for her to reliably get in for damage with her increased bulk, such as Manifold Key and Sonic Screwdriver, both of which we can repeatedly use to make our commander completely unblockable and to untap our artifacts with, to either grant her pseudo-vigilance or get extra uses out of our bigger mana rocks and or tap effects, Whisper Silk Cloak, which also makes her Ginger unblockable while granting her targeting protection in the form of Shroud to make her even harder for our opponents to deal with, and Cauldra Complete, which does require a huge mana investment but does come with its own body we can use to protect ourselves with or swing in with, on top of granting the equipped creature a plus 5 plus 5 stat bump, first strike trample indestructible haste, and an exile themed death touch to turn the equipped creature into a very resilient, annoying to block and hard hitting beat stick, whether that be the germ it comes into play equipped to, or Sir Ginger once we move it on to her. Then, in order to make our commander even harder for our opponents to remove once she starts accumulating counters, we'll be adding both Swiftfoot Boots and Mask of Avacyn to our arsenal, each of which grant the equipped creature Hexproof to stem the otherwise inevitable torrent of removal spells that would come our commander's way once she gets rolling, with the former also granting haste to enable some of our tap effect creatures if we need to get use out of their effects immediately without giving our opponents a chance to react, and the latter providing a serviceable stat boost to bring Sir Ginger ever closer to two or even one shot range. And while on the topic of boosting our commander stats, we'll be adding in an additional pair of plus one plus one counter distributing artifacts to help grow Sir Ginger into a commander damage dealing threat even faster. Those being Tarion's Soul Cleaver, which essentially just doubles Sir Ginger's own counter generation as we sack away our artifacts, while simultaneously loading her up with even more counters as our opponents lose their creatures and artifacts, and granting her vigilance on top of that to allow us to keep her up to intercept attacks, and Animation Module, which does let us get an extra plus one plus one counter per turn on our commander for three mana, but will be primarily running to take advantage of our commander's innate counter generation to get extra 1-1 one, one artifact bodies into play at one mana a pop, helping us go wide with extra artifacts as our commander goes tall so we can intercept attacks with them or sack them away for value. And finally, as our last artifact in this build, we'll be running Mystic Forge, whose artifact site is excellent for us considering roughly two-thirds of our deck consists of artifacts, essentially turning the top of our deck into an additional card in hand that replaces itself as we cast it, that, if we end up not being able to cast it, we always have the option to exile it away to hopefully hit something that we can cast. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. 
Joining us as our lone planeswalker in this build, we have Ugin the Ineffable, which is admittedly one of the very few planeswalker options we have access to in Colorless, but actually does a lot for our build's core stats via the passive cost reduction he provides to all our spells to let us cast them even faster, the pseudo card draw he provides via his token creation to help replenish our resources, and the powerful permanent removal he brings to the table to allow us to deal with almost any of our opponent's threats, ultimately making him a superb addition even if he is one of our only options. That covers our singular planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. So, as you may imagine, we'll be running a considerable amount of utility lands in this build due to us being in colorless and wastes, while definitely being cheaper than they used to be, are not quite budget enough to run more than a few. So let's quickly run down all the ones that made it into the final build. On the removal side of things, we'll be running Encroaching Wastes, Ghost Quarter, and Volatile Fault as sources of non-basic land destruction we can use to pop our opponent's utility lands with, with the latter also giving us a treasure for our troubles to help empower our commander with, as well as Blast Zone, which we can pump mana into to use as permanent removal or even a partial board wipe if there happens to be a large number of same CMC permanents in play. Then switching gears to draw sources, we have Arch of Araska, Bonders Enclave, and War Room all making it in as decent sources of repeatable draw from our land slot that, thanks to our wide array of mana rocks and treasure generation, we should generally have enough mana to pay for their effects so they can keep our hands topped off. Then pivoting once again, to ramp this time, we'll of course be running Myriad Landscape, which helps us fetch up the handful of wastes we'll be running to help speed up our mana base in the early game, alongside Hall of Taxon, which we can pump mana into to create Power Stone tokens to help us cast our artifacts, or, if needed, to use as sack fodder for our sack outlets instead. Then with our core stat padding lands out of the way, let's move on to lands we'll be using to empower our commander with. Opening with the plus one plus one counter distributing lands, Dranith Ruins and Forge of Heroes, both of which can give our commander some starting counters the turn she comes down to start building her up out of the gate, Tyrite Sanctum, which we can repeatedly use to get counters on our commander, or, if needed, we can crack and sack to permanently make Sir Ginger indestructible for additional protection, and of course, Karn's Bastion, which we can pump mana into to repeatedly proliferate all the counters on our commander as well as all our other permanents. And then as our last commander enabling land, we'll be running Rogue's Passage, which gives us one last way to make our commander evasive, this time from our land slot, to ensure she can reliably get in for damage with her increased bulk. From there, we'll be adding in some direct artifact supporting lands to the build in the form of Buried Ruin and Phyrexia's Core, which provide us with an additional artifact recursion piece and an artifact sack outlet respectively, as well as the indirect artifact support cards, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, and a Tomb of the Spirit Dragon, which are both technically colorless support pieces, but in this case still support all our artifacts with the eventual ramp and life gain they provide us with. And then, as our final wave of utility lands, we'll be running Crystal Grotto, the Grey Havens, and Zalfirin Void as scry lands to help improve our consistency as they come down via their scry one, Urza's Tower, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Power Plant as individually basic colorless lands that, if assembled, provide us a gigantic boost to our mana base, and Urza's Factory, which gives us the option to pump mana into it to create artifact bodies if we have more mana than we know what to do with. And lastly, we'll be running 10 Wastes as our basics to close out our mana base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 17 creatures including our commander, 0 instants, 1 sorcery, 0 enchantments, 46 artifacts, 1 planeswalker, and 35 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 63 artifacts, 14 sources of artifact tokens, 26 cards that care about artifacts either directly or indirectly, 34 self-sacking artifacts or artifact sack outlets, 6 sources of artifact recursion, 
8 sources of evasion and or trample granting, 6 sources of targeting or destruction protection, and 8 sources of additional plus 1 plus 1 counters. Leaving us with an artifact heavy build with plenty of artifacts and payoffs for them, a wide variety of artifacts that can sack themselves or others to empower our commander as well as ways to bring those artifacts back to be used again, and plenty of ways for us to empower Sir Ginger further by making her evasive, resilient, or even bigger. For general deck stats, we have 26 ramp sources, 14 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 1 board wipe. Our ramp being off the charts in this build due to a lot of it coming from either treasure or mana rocks with sack effects attached that we'll be using to empower our commander as we need to, while our other stats fall within more normal parameters. Then taking a look at our mana curve, we have 3 0 drops, 14 1 drops, 17 2 drops, 14 3 drops, 7 4 drops, 3 5 drops, 3 6 drops, 3 7 drops, and 1 11 drop, giving us a relatively low to the ground curve that aims to load up our board with cheap, preferably self sacking artifacts in the early game, followed by our commander, ideally alongside some ways to keep her alive. Then from there, we can begin sacrificing away our artifacts, either to their own effects or to our sack outlets to generate us value, loading up our commander with counters while she provides us with repeatable card selection in the process, slowly turning her into a bigger and bigger threat that we can make even more dangerous by making her resilient against our opponent's removal and evasive to bypass their blockers, until she, ironically, takes enough massive bites out of our opponent's life totals to win us the game. Currently, this deck is valued at $65, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can consider swapping out the Mana Rocks, Stone Speaker Crystal, and Thran Dynamo for Foundry Inspector and Joyrus Familiar, both of which provide ramp in the form of cost reduction for our artifacts to help us get more artifacts into play faster while increasing our creature count, though at the cost of not being able to help us pay for the activated abilities of our lands and artifacts, and Scavenged Brawler can be replaced with Hangerback Walker provided we would rather have a body we can slowly build up over time with counters that builds up our board upon death, rather than a body that eventually grows our commander on death instead. Then for upgrades, we can cut Piston Sledge for Arcbound Ravager, which serves as another, more reliable free sack outlet that, when it's dealt with, lets us put its counters onto our commander thanks to Modular to help build her up even further. Stone Speaker Crystal can be replaced with Krark Clan Ironworks as another free sack outlet that this time ramps us, so we can cast even more spells while proccing our commander, and, for those who are willing to spend quote-unquote irresponsible amounts of money, we can replace the Cantrip Dungeoneer's Pack and the Equipment Cauldra Complete with the Ozolith and Commander's Plate. The former serving as a cheap insurance policy if our commander's dealt with, to ensure we can get the counter she accumulated right back onto her as we recast her, and the latter, for only a single mana, providing our commander with protection from all colors and a respectable stat boost to drastically increase her survivability, evasion, and damage output, making them both superb additions that will only cost us roughly the total cost of this entire deck if we want to run them. What a deal. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the channel subscribers for having helped the channel reach its 16.4k subscriber milestone. It's thanks to all of your continued support that this channel keeps growing, so sincerely, thank you. Now, with Sir Ginger covered, it looks like it's Totentanz's turn up to rat, I mean bat, to close out our backlog of commander builds. So look forward to an Aristocrats rat-themed build featuring him coming up next, which will then be followed by a build featuring the last poll winner, Shalatoyak the Smiling Flood. So look forward to those two builds coming soon. 
Now, for this week's poll, let's turn our sights to the Lost Caverns of Ixalan set proper and give some of the commanders from the main set a chance to shine. As such, this week's lineup will consist of the artifact-themed draw source, a call pakal first among equals, the life-gaining board wipe, Amalia Benavida Sagire, and the slow-flickering Abuelo Ancestral Echo. So please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and which commanders you want to see me feature in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.